In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Christ is in our midst. For years, psychologists have observed that when we hold a set of beliefs and then we act contrary to them, that we feel a type of internal discomfort, that it's impossible for us to have and hold a set of beliefs and act inconsistently with them and not have a type of psychological or even a physical reaction to that. And that reaction they called dissonance. And so they developed this theory, the theory of cognitive dissonance. That is when we believe one thing and our actions or our behaviors don't align with that. The incongruency between what we believe and what we do causes discomfort or dissonance. The classic example when you look this up and the way that psychologists teach this is using smoking. They say a smoker knows and understands smoking is unhealthy for me and I smoke. These two conflicting one behavior, one belief causes a type of internal dissonance, an internal conflict. And there are three ways that we can either get out of this because we as human beings want integration, and we'll talk about that later. We can either change our attitude, we can change our behavior, or we can change our perception of that behavior. So taking our example, we have the smoker who knows that smoking is wrong and yet smokes. We'll talk about how they manage and how they change their attitude or behavior or change their perception in a second. But the reason that I'm talking to you about cognitive dissonance, the reason I'm talking to you about this discomfort is because we see it primarily expressed today within this scripture reading. And we see it in other places later on. And we see how some in the church and the followers of Christ deal with this dissonance and this inconsistency and how some don't. And so today, Christ is confronted with two demoniacs. And it's the demons, it's not the men themselves, but it's the demons who cry out to him and say, what have you to do with us, O son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? It is a torment for them. They are in discomfort. There's dissonance there. But why? Because these demons profess. What are you here for, O Son of God? They know who he is. They confess. In fact, Christ, in reference to this, another point in the gospel says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. Why? Because the demons know who he is. And even his brother, James, the brother of the Lord, in his universal letter, when he's talking to people about the difference between their faith and their action, he says to them, quote, you believe that there is one God good for you. Even the demons believe. But you want to know what's true, O foolish man? Faith without works is dead. A belief that Christ is the Son of God, an understanding of this without actions to back it up, or living our life in a way that is consistent with that leads to the torment that the demons feel. Christ is not there poking them and prodding them and actually tormenting them. What is torment is to stand in the presence of the Lord and confess this is God and to not care about it. That's what they do. They know that he is the Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth. They know that he is the son of the father. They know that he sends his Holy Spirit. They know all of these things, and yet they actively reject it. They say, it doesn't matter to me. And so when he comes and he forces them, just by his mere presence, to feel this incongruency, they view it as torment and torture. these demons refuse to change their behavior and they refuse to change their belief. So they change their perception, the third option in how to resolve cognitive dissonance. They ask if they can be put away. I'm not gonna confess you as God, 
any more than I already have because that's true. But I'm also not going to stop rejecting you and trying to attack and torment your creation. But I can't do it here because it's too painful. So send me over there. And they go into the pigs and run off and eventually perish. But that was all about them trying to heal their dissonance. But in reality, they can't get away from it. Their belief is not a belief like, my favorite color is yellow. This belief is truth. Christ is the Son of God. This is not a belief that is up for debate or objection. This is truth, eternal, unchanging. And so the option to change their behavior or change their attitude, change their belief, is not afforded to them because they can't. This is true. And so because of that, because of their unwillingness to engage with that truth, they will forever feel that torment and that torture unless they bring their actions to align with it. Another example later in the scriptures is St. Paul. As he writes to the Romans about his own internal struggles with sin, because in reality, if we are strong Orthodox Christians founded in our beliefs and the teachings of the church, sin comes from these exact situations. When what we know to be right and true is something that we don't do, or our behaviors don't match up with that. And I've never heard it better expressed than by St. Paul in the Romans, when he says, for what I am doing, I don't understand. For, that, for what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. For the good that I will to do, I do not do. But the evil I will not to do, that I practice. I haven't heard a better definition of knowing sinfulness than that. And yet, it's a struggle. And we don't malign St. Paul for this struggle. He's articulating something we've all experienced and felt, that dissonance, that discomfort. He's beside himself because he knows what he should do. He knows the teachings of Christ. He knows the truth. And yet he struggles to will himself and to change his actions and to do that which is good and to avoid that which is evil. This is his struggle. And he goes on to describe it and he says, now if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin who dwells in me. This is how St. Paul is identifying sin. Sin is when we strive against what we know to be true and right and what we have received. He's not up for the conversation about changing our beliefs. He's up for the conversation about changing our actions. If we go back to the smoker, we can see that the way that the smoker might overcome this dissonance, as we said, there are threes that change their belief. They might say that the research on smoking is not conclusive, therefore it's not that bad. Change their understanding of smoking. They might change their action and stop smoking. Or they might change their perception of the belief. Smoking is bad, and I smoke, but I don't smoke that much. And so either one, any of these three, removes and eases that internal tension. But cognitive dissonance as a psychological theory and explanation for human action is great in explaining the problem, but not the solution. Because for us as Orthodox Christians, we do not have these three options. We have but the one, to change our actions, to hold on to the truth, because the beliefs that we hold are not subject to debate. Christ is Lord. He is our creator. He is our sovereign master. He has given us his life. He has died on the cross. He has resurrected from the dead. He has sent his Holy Spirit. He is present in the sacraments. These are all truths, not beliefs. And so if we live our life 
in conflict with that, if we know that that is true and we will to live an integrated life, then all we have is to monitor our actions and to live in concordance and integration with that truth. This is something that you see time and time again, again, outside of the context. The world itself is moving in a way that constantly demands this type of total integration. No longer will we allow for people to speak and act one way and believe another. The entire basis of what has come to be called cancel culture is built on the need for integration. You said one thing, but you did something else. You present yourself as one way, but you've said something else. You present yourself in this way, but you've done something else. That lack of integration is what the younger generations are rebelling against. No longer is it possible for us or the world to live inauthentically or unintegrated or disintegrated. The desire, both psychological but also spiritual and now societal, for integration, for us to be authentic and true at all times, is permeating not just your heart, your mind, your soul, and even your communities. The way in which we do that, the way in which we build peaceful societies, the way in which we build peace within our heart, the way in which we remove this dissonance, is to conform our actions to the truth and the will of God. The Orthodox Church is here to welcome, to accept, and to love and embrace all who come to her all who are experiencing dissonance, all who are experiencing disintegration, all who are struggling like St. Paul, and to teach them, to teach them how to integrate, how to reduce this dissonance, and how to find peace within their heart and their soul. This is the role of a spiritual father, and this is the role of the sacrament of confession that we come forward to speak about that which we will not to do and yet cannot help but do. And to learn from our spiritual father, from our confessor, what it is we need to do to live a more integrated, whole and authentic life. To change our actions in order to fit our beliefs. This is the spiritual life of an Orthodox Christian. This is the sacrament of confession and this this desire to integrate is what separates us from the demons and opens to us the path and the gates of heavenly paradise. Amen.